kid. I hear it's your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. Szanowni Państwo, witamy Państwa w kolejnym Winnovators. Chciałem bardzo przeprosić za prywatę, bo zacznijmy jednak od początku. Mamy wśród nas trzech wybitnych profesorów, naszego specjalnego gościa, profesora Hermana Zimona. Mamy profesora Cieśnika, który będzie moderował z profesorem rozmowę. Mamy również z nami profesora Grzegorza Mazurka, ale mamy z nami również Pawła Paska, z którym współorganizuje te spotkania, które dzisiaj obchodził urodziny i dlatego postanowiłem trochę prywatnie wykorzystać tę okazję, żeby złożyć mu życzenia. Paweł, wszystkiego najlepszego. Nie zabieramy już więcej czasu. Powiedz jeszcze parę słów i przechodźmy do tego niezmiernie interesującego dzisiejszego spotkania. Bardzo, bardzo dziękuję. Good evening, profesor. Ja, yeah, good evening. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Hi, good Thank evening. you very much that you are with us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us. Uh, it's true, it's my birthday today. Uh, so it's your presence is my uh, birthday present. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Pavel. Happy birthday. Uh, okay, so let's um, start the uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Lars uh, Goodhell from um, uh, Ahaka Poland, please uh, say a few words from you. Uh, you are our partner, so the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. No, mamy, mamy jakiś problem, to proponuję, żebyśmy przeszli dalej i poproszę o głos profesor Mazurek. The floor is yours because of internet, problem with internet connection. Thank you, Bartosz. Uh, happy birthday, Paweł. Uh, Thank you. It's great that that's the way you want to celebrate, meaning you are working and spending great time, hopefully with us, I'm not hopeful, it's quite sure, I'm quite sure about it. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear professor, and uh, dear uh, visitors of today's <laughs> webinar, I'll be clear and short and concise because I'm not the, I'm just the, uh, part of uh, introductory session, so so I don't want to spend too much of your time, just want to say a couple of, three, three things perhaps. Uh, the first thing is my personal uh, perspective about Professor Herman Zimon, uh, which in my uh, humble opinion is, uh, is like the Sevres uh, model, meaning he's, he's the professor, perfect professor of the times we live right now, because it's not only that he's successful in terms of his research activities, but the applicability of his knowledge, his wisdom in business as a professor of management is immense. So that's that's the unique person in a research world which achieved both huge success in, in science and amazing success in business. And so this is this is also maybe not happy birthday celebration, but that's a huge celebration for me to be here today to in a way introduce Professor Hermann Zimmon uh, below of us. The second thing I wanted to say is that I, that I am really happy because Professor Hermann Zimmon is for many years uh, tightly connected with Kozminski University as a member of our international advisory, uh, international corporate advisory board. And his hints, opinions and remarks are of utmost importance for us 
or Kozminski, which uh, is very bold in its uh, international um, perspective and wants to achieve a lot, not only in Poland, but uh, at least in Europe. So, Professor Hermann Simon, thank you very much for being with us and for sharing your uh, amazing expertise in higher education institutions area as well. And the third thing I want to say is that uh, Poland is great because of at least one reason. There are at least, I know, three amazing books of Hermann Simon published in Polish language. So those of you who are not very good in reading in English, for sure the book, for instance, about the pricing strategies and the recent book about the way of building success of companies. Those are, there's a great books which are not dull, which are theoretical, which are based on uh, secondary research, those are great uh, insights in the modern world, how we should build our competitive advantage and how can we take advantage of uh, the mega trends which are around uh, for building the success of particular uh, enterprise. Uh, I wanted to be short and concise. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Professor Hermann Simon, thank you once again for everything you do for the business for the global community community of, of uh, businessmen, business women as well, and for Kozminski University as well, which is my particular thank you to you and uh, to your uh, to your uh, wisdom and, and and hints you give uh, to us as a university. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grigosh. Very nice. Uh, I haven't been to Kosminski for a couple of years due to Corona, but I hope I will be able to visit again in the near future. Standing invitation, Herman. So whenever you want, just come yeah. to us. But I don't know where you are right now, actually. Is it Shanghai? Is it, is it Berlin? Is it Frankfurt or maybe New York? I am actually in the room where I was spawned 75 years ago in my farmhouse in the Eiffel that's in the very western part of Germany. So it's not far so, from Bonn. Uh, <clears throat> it's not far from Bonn, yeah. It's rather close to Bonn. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I can see that uh, we have uh, Lars with us um, uh, again. Uh, I hope now the uh, internet connection is uh, better. So, uh, Lars, the floor is yours. So, it's my turn now. Yeah. Yeah. Th th thank you. Yeah. I hope you can hear me. Um, I can hear you. I, I, I'm pretty uh, moved. So, I'm, thank I'm, you I'm very much. In my kitchen well, last now, and I you are I, speaking uh, now. A connection uh, will be a bit better. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Simon, I think I should, uh, I should say some few words in the beginning, if, if I am yes. correct. Yes. Oh. Okay, who can guide us on the program? <laughs> Maybe Lars first. Lars first, yes. I second, and Professor Simon follows me, okay? Yes. Let's, let's, uh, Lars, please. All good. Everything is okay. Um, so I hope you can, can hear me and I hope the connection does not fall away. Uh, I can just uh, basically um, totally agree to what uh, has been said. And uh, I, um, uh, I remember very, um, very well that I met Professor Simon I think 11 years ago in the Netherlands. He will not remember that, but for me, it was a big thing. Um, we organized a meeting there for the German Dutch Chamber in the residence of the German ambassador. Beautiful building and the speech of Professor Simon was amazing. And that's also why I have the book in Dutch uh, and uh, not in English. <laughs> um, and um, so it's great to, to be here. Thank you very much for we innovators also to, to uh, invite us as partners for this event. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, maybe very briefly, out of the perspective of our chamber, um, the German-Polish Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, we are representing the German business in Poland, Polish business in, in Germany. And uh, uh, very often I hear, ah, unfortunately, when it comes to innovation, 
then Poland is still too dependent on international investors and there's not enough uh, innovation in the country. And uh, I believe that, um, of course, you know, there, when it comes to hidden champions, when it comes to innovation out of industrial companies, for example, and Germany is, of course, uh, quite unique, um, uh, but uh, there is a lot of innovation happening in Poland as well. And a lot of it is happening also in the bilateral context. Um, I think Poland has made its uh, position as a very innovative and important partner to, to German industry and German business. It's the fifth most important trade partner uh, now. So that's an amazing result, uh, fantastic development. And uh, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to R&D, Poland is growing all the time. The startup system uh, has, uh, has shown a really fantastic development. There are some uh, amazing innovative companies. So um, uh, I think the development is very promising, especially when it comes to IT experts. Um, uh, Poland is the number one spot in the CE countries, um, and that shows also in investment by, by German companies like Bayer, for example, it has just invested in a tech hub in Warsaw. It's looking for 600 uh, IT experts there. So there is a pool of, uh, of really good workforce, of really uh, you know, inno innovative people. And um, well, it's of course with mixed emotion that uh, the Ukraine war uh, might even push Poland in an even more interesting position in the long run. Uh, when we look at uh, the numbers, there are 30,000 IT experts who have registered in Poland from Russia, from Belarus, and unfortunately also from Ukraine um, since the beginning of the year. And that's uh, like 10 times more than normal. So, uh, of course, we see that there is a big brain drain from these countries. And uh, Poland is, I think, the, the um, priority market where these people come to. So that gives another boost. And what we feel as a chamber is uh, that Poland is, of course, also gaining um, a lot of uh, strength as a nearshoring market um, due to the corona pandemic um, supply chain difficulties that we see at the moment. So there will be a lot of investment coming also by um, replacement from you know, investors who have been in Russia and Belarus who might now look for new um, locations. So all this is actually, in fact, um, a good basis for innovation in the future. Um, and um, maybe it works out that also maybe by working together, there might be some more hidden champions coming from Poland as well. So this would be uh, definitely a good thing. Um, maybe one last word from my side as AHK, we support innovative companies. We have just launched this week, um, this year's competition for the Polish German Business Award. And that's all about innovation bilateral projects. So if here's somebody who is listening to this, who might be interested in participating in this competition, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, please get in touch with me or with somebody else from our chamber to learn more about it. Um, and I'm looking very forward to, um, to today, to tonight, uh, and uh, the discussion and the presentation. Um, Hermann Simon, uh, all my appreciation to you, you are a great ambassador uh, also for uh, the German economy. So um, once again, thank you very much and great evening to everybody. Thank you very much, you. Lars. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, because I had a strange technical problem here. I have a ring light. When I turned the ring light on, the external cam uh, camera did no longer work. But I, I have set it up now. Um, with uh, the uh, camera in the in the computer in the laptop, so I hope it works. Can you see me? Yes, professor. Everything looks uh, okay. The only thing is that uh, your presentation uh, disappeared uh, because it was. Now, now we can see it. Oh, okay, it is. Okay, we have it. Okay, uh, so uh, is it there? Uh, Yes, yes, we we have it. I will add it to presentation. No, I see it now too. Yeah. Okay, but we let let give give a floor now to Professor Jerzy uh, Cieślik. Uh, uh, professor, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. So thank you for invitation. This is fascinating topic uh, of the webinar: the hidden champions, the new game in the. Chinese century. Uh, we are extremely fortunate 
uh, fortunate to have with us Professor Hermann Simon, who has introduced this topic of hidden champion uh, champions in the management and globalization debate back in the 19th, 1990s. At that time, it is, was a very provocative idea because it, global world, global trade, global investment have been dominated by large transnational corporations. And the idea uh, that it, smaller firms uh, being uh, leaders in very small niche markets and not publicly visible can play important role and in fact determine the position of uh, their home countries in the global economy was uh, innovative and and pro provocative i think the the german and the role of germany in in global trade and investment was the most profound example and in fact it has uh, inspired uh, many researchers and to some degree the policy makers uh, around the world uh, to, to conduct further research. Also in uh, so-called emerging economies, also in our region in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Uh, here I should recall the work done on uh, East European hidden champions with the involvement of, uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Marek Dietl from Poland, who may join us uh, later on. He just uh, arrive uh, from Davos. Uh, we have uh, researched this topic of, uh, of hidden champions uh, in at Kosminski University. Recently, I should mention, we have conducted an empirical study together with the Polish Statistical Office of Poland, uh, uh, identifying the pool of potential candidates of uh, hidden champions uh, in Poland. Uh, probably we can discuss it on this topic later on. Uh, so referring to the, the idea of, of hidden champions, uh, Professor Hermann Simon is also a successful businessman and uh, while promo promoting the idea of hidden, cha uh, hidden champions, he had also uh, proven it's the, the feasibility of this concept by establishing back in the 1980s uh, Simon Kuhar and pa uh, Partners, which is a profound example that a hidden champion company can be successful. Uh, Professor Simon, uh, uh, the floor is yours then. Chelsea, thank you very much, Dobrytien, <laughs> and uh, thank you all for these nice introductions and um, revoking some memories. Uh, last, I remember uh, the event in Holland, and uh, Chelsea, it's wonderful to see you again. And Grigorz, I don't know whether we met at Kosminski, but I hope we will meet uh, next time when I come. So let's start. Uh, was my speech, Hidden Champions, a new game in the Chinese century. And uh, the, the, the book with the same title now uh, will appear in about uh, four weeks, Hidden Champions in the, in the Chinese century. And let's have a look at the exports in the last decade. Um, I, I have now here something which doesn't belong here. So first, the absolute exports over 10 years. And we see here that China is already number one by a big distance. That's amazing because for the first time on an annual base, China became number one in 2009 uh, when the West was stagnating and the Chinese economy and exports kept growing. Now they are by far over the 10 years the number one. A second USA, shortly behind that Germany and all the other countries much smaller. Uh, 
if we look at the per capita exports for the same decade, we see a different picture. Here, Germany is by far the number one, followed by Korea. And the other large uh, European exporters, France, Italy, etc., are only about half the German exports. So how can that be? What is the reason? Why is Germany and why is China so strong in exports? And the first idea when you ask this question is that it may be due to large, well-known corporations like uh, Mercedes, BMW, uh, BASF, Bayer, Siemens in Germany and similar corporations in the other countries. And actually, this hypothesis is true for most countries. I show you here the Fortune Global 500 companies on the horizontal axis and the exports on the vertical axis. And you see for USA, Japan, uh, Korea, etc., it's almost a linear correlation between the number of large corporations and the export performance. But there are two exceptions, China and Germany. And we have seen China number one in absolute, Germany in per capita terms. So what is different for these two export leaders compared to the rest of the world? It's the role of mid-sized companies, what we call Mittelstand in German. In China, about 68 of these huge exports come from companies with less than 3,000 employees. And in Germany, also about two thirds come from mid-sized companies and not from the large exporters. So we see here, yes, you need large corporations to uh, be good in exports, but to really excel, you need, in addition, a very strong mid-sized sectors of global exporters. And these are the hidden champions. So what is a hidden champion? A hidden champion is a company which belongs to the top three in the world, has a revenue of less than five billion euros and is not known, so hidden in the public. Now you may say, but five billion euros, that's not the typical size of a, of a, of a mid-sized company. But you have to see that on a global scale and in relation to the Fortune Global 500. The Global 500 have an average revenue of 64 billion and the smallest of them still crosses 25 billion euros or dollars. So the hidden champions are a new category, not really big, but also not typical small size like the baker at, at the corner. A new category of global companies somewhere in the middle between the small local firm and the big corporations. Now, when we look at the development of globalization, we see a big difference in, in the last 30 years. From 1919 to 2010, we had a phase called hyper-globalization. That means that global exports grew more than the global cross domestic product. And since 2010, we have a relative deglobalization. Global exports grew less than the global GDP. And you see it here in this picture that shows the so called trade elasticity. That's the gross rate of global exports divided by the gross rate of global GDP. We call that trade elasticity, relation of two percentages, gross rates. And you see that was higher than two until 99. Till 2009, it was still about 1.5, meaning that exports were growing 50% more than GDPs. And especially since 2014, it's less than one. 
That was well before Trump came on the stage. It's a development which actually started after the financial crisis. And this development will probably go on in the coming years. Now, a short look at the economic world in 2030. On the horizontal axis, the growth in billion dollars, and on the vertical axis, the cross domestic product, and we see a world split into two parts. The first global league, uh, USA, China, European Union, US is still the, the number one, not in, in purchasing power parity terms, but in absolute terms. China, by far the largest contributor to growth. And then far away, the second global league was Japan, India, Middle East, Brazil, Russia, etc. So what does this mean for the strategy of Satan champions? It means that the global competition is determined in the first global league. The first global league will account for about 60% of the cross domestic product of the world. And how does globalization develop in the next uh, decade or two? Relative deglobalization is very likely to continue. It's driven by many, many factors. Uh, goods exports will be substituted by foreign direct investments. So we will see more production in the target market, less exports, say, from Germany to China or from China to Germany. We experience, of course, a dematerialization of international exchange. Service exports are still, still growing faster than GDPs. Digitalization, remote 3D printing where the data are in one country and the product will be printed out in the target market. And of course, Zoom, I am now not in Basel. Uh, I am traveling digitally. And I have been doing that for more than two years now. Uh, whereas before, I went sometimes for uh, one speech to China and flew uh, two tons of carbon dioxide into the air. And the biggest challenge here is, in this new context, to find the best location for each activity. And this means a, a, a total relocation of the global value chain. Just to give you a few examples. Two German companies, which are in the mining technology sector, have relocated their competence centers for mining technology to China. We have no more mining in Germany. In China, it's still very important. So you can only do the business there if you want to be close to your customers. Another hidden champion, Vilo, leading pump manufacturer of high-tech pumps, is uh, building its competence center for artificial intelligence in China. They say the conditions to develop artificial intelligence product and processes are better in China than in Europe. But this is not only in one direction, uh, Chinese all Chinese automotive manufacturers have, for instance, a design and development center in Germany because they say Germany is the best country to design, especially premium cars. And uh, we see uh, Tesla is just, uh, has just opened a new huge factory close to Berlin. Intel announced an $80 billion investment for eight uh, gigafactories in Europe, and uh, the, main, the main location will be Magdeburg in, in uh, Eastern Germany. So we see that companies are looking, are challenged to find the best location, be it in the Silicon Valley, be it in Poland, be it in China. And uh, the value chain will be reorganized. And that will lead to huge investments, for instance, just before Corona, I had a meeting with 100 Chinese automotive suppliers, and they said, we all want to manufacture in Germany. So we all build plants there or acquire companies. So this is the development we have to experience in globalization. Now to the hidden champions. 
they have experienced spectacular growth in the last three decades. Here I show you on the left uh, part of this slide three which have become big champions, the F Group, uh, Fresenius Medical Care and SAP. These were companies in the range of two to three billion euros in 95 and today they are in the range of 25 to, to 35, so 10 times larger. Growth stories you would only expect in the Silicon Valley, but not in old Germany. Uh, on the right side, uh, three hidden champions, Prose, global leader in, in uh, door systems, um, DAXA, European leader in, uh, in logistics, and Bechtle in um, IT. These were companies in the range of about several hundred million euros, and now they are at five to six billion again. 10 times larger. And the same picture in the, in the smaller group, Rational, global leader in equipment for professional kitchens, Birkenstock, you know, these sandals, Egos, global leader in ball bearings made from plastics. These were companies around 50 million 25 years ago and now approaching the 1 billion mark and some smaller ones. On the right side, uh, Formula D, Special Automotive Services, Simon Kutcher, our, our company, Rofa Group, Automation uh, Specialist. These were companies with less than 10 million in revenue, and now they are up around 400 or 500. So we have seen very, very uh, strong growth stories. Now, what, what determines the success? I call this the wheel of success. The core of these strategies of Sydney champions is the ambition to be the best in their market. How do they achieve that? Through focus. Only focus leads to world class. Obviously innovation. And that combined with globalization and more recently Two factors have come into the game, digitalization and business ecosystem. And I will illustrate each of these aspects of the strategy by concrete examples. Ambition to be the best. Stiel, the global leader in chain source, says either we are the best or we don't do it. Either we are the best or we don't do it. Or Marke Vision global leader in computer-generated imagery, our ambition is to be the absolute number one worldwide. Absolute number one worldwide. And uh, DeepL, the best translation machine, I don't know whether you know it, I can only recommend it, I use it all the time for all kinds of languages. We deliver the best translation in the world. There it starts with the ambition, the role of the entrepreneur, we want to be the best in our market. So you achieve that through focus. Again, a couple of concrete examples. Team viewer, global market leader in screen sharing, remote screen control. We focus on remote support worldwide. Limit check, global leader in software for architects and engineers. Focus on one thing and be the world's best at it. Or Flexi, world market leader in retractable dock leashes. We only focus on one thing, but we do it better than anyone else. Only focus leads to world class. But focus has a big disadvantage. It makes a market small. If you sell retractable dock leashes only in Germany or in Poland, that would be a very small market. So how do you make the market large? By globalizing. And here I show you the globalization history of Kersha, the world market leader in high pressure water cleaners. They started with their internationalization in the 1970s. And ever since then, they have added one, sometimes two or three new subsidiaries to their global network. They have now 129 subsidiaries, also a huge plant in China. 
And I recently asked their CEO, he's 52 years old, what is the further history of your globalization, the future history? And he said, my ambition is to be in all United Nations countries during my tenure. So he has to go about another 10 years. It means he will have to open about 100 more subsidiaries. They go directly into the market. They don't uh, sell through distributors, agents, or intermediaries. They do it on their own. And um, since I was mentioning the title, The Chinese Century, the Chinese hidden champions will be the most serious, most dangerous competitors. Where do they stand with regard to globalization? They are in a very early stage, and we see this in the comparison here. A couple of uh, German hidden champions like Hillebrand, global leader for uh, logistics for alcohol beverages, is in 22 countries. Kersha uh, showed it already, 129. The Chinese are in a very early stage. They usually have less than 10 subsidiaries outside China. Some have more here, like Hikvision uh, Surveillance, that's a rather large company, or Mindtray Medical Technology. But typically, they have less than 10 subsidiaries. Now, to the new rules of the game and the driving forces, innovation, digitalization, business ecosystems, and uh, sustainability. Innovation, the hidden champions spent double the industry average for research and development. What is more important, they have five times more patents than the average. Average is six patents per thousand employees for firms from patent intensive sectors and the hidden champions have 31 patents per 1,000 employees. And I show you now a few videos of breakthrough innovations coming from hidden champions. Oh, this, strangely, this doesn't work. This is supposed to be the Volocopter. That is the first electric helicopter in the world, which actually flies. And uh, they got last year projects from Singapore and Dubai to establish an autonomous air taxi system. I have no idea why we can see the video here. This is Lilium. Uh, Videos don't work. Uh, I, I may have to put it here to a video file. Oh, it's so complicated. I just explain it. Um, how do I get back now? That is an electric vertical takeoff plane, um, Lilium, and uh, they just went public last year in New York, got a very high evaluation. Now they are a little down because some of the development has been delayed. And again, I have no idea why we can see the videos. This is HY4. That is a hydrogen plane which actually flies, uh, developed in, in Stuttgart. And uh, last case, uh, also the video does not work. That must be due to the system, because with Zoom, it always works. That's a flying pigeon, a demonstration project. A very, very technically sophisticated solution coming from Festo. And Festo is the global leader in pneumatics, which is a core element of automation. And whenever I visit a factory in, in China or elsewhere, I always ask, do you have Festo equipment in your factory? And the answer is 100%. I have never visited a factory anywhere in the world which did not have Festo components in its, uh, in its machines and robots, etc. So we see many, many breakthrough innovations coming from hidden champions, but in niche markets, not in the big markets. And here again, a comparison between German and Chinese hidden champions, a selection here. And I use the number of research and development employees to compare. And here we have a very interesting observation that the Chinese hidden champions employ many more research and development people. Let me here just compare Carl Zeiss, 
global leader in optical and photonics products. They have 3,100 R&D employees. And if we compare it with Hick Vision, the global leader in surveillance or security cameras, they have 9,300, three times more. And that too seems to be a typical magnitude that with comparable revenue, Chinese companies employ three times more people in research and development. And that reminds me of an old story. I visited Nokia in Finland in 2004. At that time, they had almost 50% of the mobile phone market and were very arrogant, I must say. And they said, we are invincible. We have 19,000 people in research and development, 19,000. A very large number. And three years later, I attended a presentation by the CEO of Huawei that was in, in Delhi, India. And he said, we have 52,000 employees in research and development. Again, about three times more. And you know what came of this story. So I think this is a point which the Germans and other hidden champions have to take very, very seriously. And this also brings me back to the, uh, the, the lesson, find the best location in the world. It also means that German companies, Polish companies, European, American, have to do research and development in China uh, to, to be close to the, uh, the, the, the technologies of the future, especially in artificial intelligence. Um, again, sorry that we don't see the video. This is a video which shows you the following. The ascent of China in terms of international patents. In 2000, China was not among the top 10 in international patents. In 2004, it joined the top 10. In 2012, it overtook Germany. In 2016, Japan, and today it's number one in international patents. So this is really very, very impressive. The ascent of China in terms, and these are not Chinese. Chinese patents are not the same, but international patents have the high standard we have in, in Europe and the United States. Now, digitalization. I distinguish between business to consumer, so consumer digitalization. This is an American and Chinese game at and Europe, there are a few exceptions like Skype and Spotify, but generally we don't play a role there, and that's not going to change. Very different, it's for business to business, for industrial digitalization, where German hidden champions are very strong. And there's another difference between these two sectors. Industrial processes are highly complex. Uh, these companies are usually not started by university graduates, but by people who are deep into these processes. And let me again give you a couple of cases. I mentioned TeamViewer, global leader in uh, screen sharing, remote screen control. TeamViewer's uh, software is installed on more than 2.5 billion devices. Has any one of you ever heard of LSTM? That stands for long short term memory. And uh, you may use Siri of Apple or Alexa of uh, Amazon. LSTM is the software behind these systems. It's installed on more than 3 billion smartphones from Germany and, and Switzerland, invented by Professor Schmidt Huber from the Technical University of Munich. Or, Celonis, global leader in process mining, a company which has been evaluated at $11 billion. And a very modern area, autonomous driving. 40% of all patents are from Germany. And just a week ago, it was announced that Germany is the first country with three-level authorization. So as of next year, uh, Mercedes is uh, the only company which has this car now. They can drive autonomously on uh, highways, still with a speed limit. Uh, 
but we are not behind. We are actually leading, but nobody knows that. It, it's hidden behind, behind the visible screen. And this number is also very impressive. Um, Apple CEO Tim Cook said last year, German hidden champions play in the very top league. Up there, the air is very thin. We have 767 suppliers in Germany. Can you imagine that? Apple has 767 suppliers in Germany, all hidden or invisible, like LSTM. Very important you driving force are business ecosystems. These are corporations of legally independent companies who achieve working together uh, something which any single one of them could not achieve. And I show you two cases, extreme ultraviolet lithography, EUV for short. The customers of these huge machines are the so-called founders or integrated device manufacturers like Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor, Samsung, etc. And uh, the company which makes the machines is ASML, that's a Dutch uh, company. And there are two partners in this business ecosystem, Trumpf, which is a global leader in industrial lasers, and they contribute the laser. This laser weighs 17 tons and has 450,000 components. So in itself, the laser is an extremely complex product and size contributes the optical part, uh, which is equally complex. And as I said, these three companies in this ecosystem have practically 100% market share. Nobody else can make these machines uh, currently for the extreme ultraviolet lithography. And here I have a, a very small business ecosystem or small company, MK Technology. They make so-called investment casting systems. These are systems very complex to cast extreme complicated shapes and forms. And their customers are SpaceX, the uh, rocket company, PCC, that's a global leader in turbine plates and a similar company, General Electric, uh, in, the, in the aircraft engine division. And MK Technology is a very small company, but they have a couple of partners in the ecosystem uh, in China for a rapid prototyping, fast casting. In, in Germany, Voxeljet, uh, they make the biggest 3D printer. Um, in Russia, also uh, in, in France and Israel. And uh, for instance, they supply these systems on which the combustion chambers for the Mars rocket are made at SpaceX, the company of Elon Musk. And six of their systems do the job of 1,000 large 3D printers. Again, a case where a group of companies together can cope with extreme complexity and supply the most demanding companies in the world, like SpaceX, with very, very complex products. The last new driving force, sustainability. Some people say sustainability is a new digital, and I tend to agree. The hidden champions are leading in sustainable technology, and that's a whole variety. Just to give you one example, um, that's an Austrian hidden champion, Lansing. Um, normally, the normal shirts are made from cotton fibers. Oh, Marek, I see you. Hello, Marek. Good to see you. Hello, hello. For one shirt made of cotton fibers, you need 2,700 liters and six square meters of surface. Lensing makes fibers from wood for one shirt, and you can actually buy these shirts with H&M, with, uh, etc. You need 180 liters of water and 0.7 square meters. So roughly, you can say, one-tenth of the resources. And uh, Europe 
Germany in particular have a competitive advantage because we have the strictest regulation. So there are lots of opportunities in the sustainability sector. And again, it's ideal for hidden champions because most of these markets start as niche markets. Like today, I don't know what the market share of, um, of the uh, wood fiber uh, shirts is, but it's probably less than two or three percent. But maybe in the future, it will be uh, become the market leader. Last point, employees and leaders. Uh, of course, the employees are highly qualified and motivated. The hidden champions have a culture of top performance. And very important, the extremely high employee loyalty. The churn rate, the turnover rate is only 2.7% per year. For Germany, the average is 7.3%. And they're very strong leaders. I, I talked about the ambition to be the best. That starts with the leader. And a very long tenure, 21 years on average. The average for large corporations is six years. I, that's tells you everything about long-term orientation. The last comparison on the general strategy between Chinese and German hidden champions, global presence for the Germans high, Chinese still low, global brands, Germans very strong, not in the public, but in their specific target groups. And uh, the Chinese are still very weak there. Growth rate, Chinese high. As the Germans grow continuously, but with much smaller rates. And then, very important, Marek, IPO. The Chinese go very early public, collect huge sums of money, and they invest that in the growth, the high growth, and into the high number of R&D employees, which I showed. So, the Chinese are not yet there. But they will be the toughest competitor. They're also strongly supported by the government. The government just started an initiative this uh, February to create 1,000 hidden champions, and they are investing, investing $1.3 billion into this initiative. In short, uh, my own hidden champion story, Gregor mentioned that um, I followed, we followed. Uh, exactly the hidden champion strategy. And Marek knows that because he opened our office in Warsaw many years. How many? When was that? In 2002? 2004, when Colin joined you. 2004. Here. So we followed the strategy one to one. The goal, ambition to be the best. We have a new motto, official in, in June, unlocking better growth, whatever that may be. Focus only on the market side strategy marketing sales pricing scope global presence so this is the the template of the hidden champion strategy where do we stand today we are the global leader in price consulting business week says simon kutcher is world leader in giving advice to companies on how to price their products and a couple of others um, we are also recognized as number one in our focused fields so financial times uh, in, in several countries, Forbes in the US. And this is our growth curve. Uh, we have um, about 1,800 employees now. Our turnover last year, I have it here in dollar, 522. In euro, it was 442 million euros. And uh, this is our global network. We have now 43 offices in 28 countries. So I can assure you uh, we even have a business school in china uh, which preaches the hidden champions concept there i can assure you it works i have tried it out and uh, the hidden champion strategy works so let me summarize globalization shifts from exports to foreign direct investments i think this is also a big chance for poland especially for investments coming from China and Asia. Always assumed that uh, the, the world does not end in a global conflict. Then, of course, everything can be different. Finding the best location in the world is mandatory. This is also interesting for countries to communicate what the best location is. For instance, Poland, very strong software IT competencies. 
Ambition to be the best is the foundation. Only focus leads to world class. Avoid diversification. Globalize the music plays in the first global league. So the global competition will not be won in, in Brazil or South Africa, but in the first global league. Do not imitate, innovate, invest heavily in R&D. Digitalization for European companies rather focus on B2B. And let me explain why, why that is so. Uber is an interesting case. Uber tested its system for several years in San Francisco. And then they rolled it out within a very short time to all large American cities. When you test something in Berlin or in Warsaw and then roll it out to Europe, you have to overcome 27 bureaucracies and 27 languages. We don't have the market size to establish global standards. And uh, Marek, if we think of Booksy, they are successful in the United States. So if you want to build a global standard, you <coughs> have to go to the US and do it from there and not from Krakow. Business ecosystems are becoming increasingly critical to master complexity. Together, several small companies can master extreme complexity. Sustainability can become the new digital. And I think in the employment sector, create a culture of high employee loyalty is very important. Of course, the war for talent is also a very big issue. Uh, currently and will be in the next years. So that was it. Uh, just my most recent books, Pevni Susk uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on profit, hidden champions, and uh, my autobiography, Many Worlds, One Life. So thank you very much for your attention. I think I spoke a little lot longer than 30 minutes, but I hope it was not too boring. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I was asked to moderate the discussions. We have several questions uh, uh, already uh, from the webinar floor, but let me start with well, my question, uh, which uh, relates to the fact that your book, you have in your title, you have in the Chinese century and uh, bearing in mind that you have a business school with your name in China as well, which means that th there must be something. So, in fact, uh, you, you put China in the front. So, the, the, I understand you believe that the role of China is sustainable. And uh, to be a little bit provocative, we are at the same age, and I was in back in the 70s, 1970s in the United States. And I remember the fascination of the uh, Japanese management style at that time. Everyone spoke about how fantastic this organization, this rigid structures and the fact that the people work for one company for, for life and so on. And when, what, did, what happened? So why uh, the... the uh, Japan disappeared from the first league, and uh, why not uh, um, this may happen to, to China as it happened to Japan? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jersey people of our age remember this uh, revolutionary book, The Machine That Changed the World, mm -hmm. in 91, uh, published. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, the real the real estate value in Tokyo was more worse than uh, the whole American <laughs> stock exchange. Um, first, I speak about entrepreneurs, about companies. I I don't make a prediction about the political future of China. Mm -hmm. uh, politics can destroy everything in China. I, I would not exclude that. But when I look at the Chinese entrepreneurs and the innovation, I said they are number one now in, uh, in international patents, their ambitions and also their technical competencies, they will become 
the most serious, the most dangerous competitors for the hidden champions from Europe and uh, the United States. If, if they can operate rather freely, if they are encumbered, uh, politicized, uh, China may, may uh, go down the train in the same way as, or, or stagnate in the same way as, as Japan did. And um, I think the role of the President Xi Jinping uh, is very risky for China. Okay. Malek has, has seen him in person. I haven't seen him in person. And uh, uh, some kind of absolute monarch and, and a party which has to say everything. If they intervene with the business, uh, it may not happen. But from the, the ambition, the, the power, the competencies of Chinese companies, and especially mid-sized companies, not the state-owned companies, but these hidden champions, I, I see what they can do and what they want to achieve. And that's why I called it hidden champions in the Chinese century. Okay. So maybe we take opportunity that, that Marek did this there. So maybe you would like to, to ask, to, to say something, to ask the question. Well, thank you very much. I don't want to steal the show. Um, <laughs> Uh, Simon is a very unique opportunity. If, uh, you can interview him, ask him questions. So I will be very brief. Uh, I, I have just came from Davos today. Sorry for the for being late for for, for this uh, for your presentation, Herman. Um, and there was, I mean, and in the Polish house and the Free Seas house, we had two locations there. there a lot, it was said a lot about China, and uh, basically, uh, people uh, uh, are quite worried. <laughs> What's gonna happen in China, uh, especially with the real estate uh, uh, prices and high uh, level of debt, uh, and also uh, I would subscribe to what Herman said about Xi. Um, uh, the, uh, our Polish colleagues here might remember that our president visited the opening of uh, Winter Olympic Games, and um, and Chairman uh, Xi called him with a special Chinese word describing old friend. And it took literally four days to Shanghai Stock Exchange, which is one of the largest in the world, to approach us how we can cooperate. What makes literally no sense because they are like 50 times bigger than us. And I asked them why you contact us. And you know, now the relations are so good and uh, and uh, uh, and your, pres uh, your president and our president are uh, and this is the special Chinese word for old friends. So we should also become old friends. So, I mean, you see, it is a, a very well functioning uh, uh, free market, but with a strong guy at the string wheel. And I'm really puzzled what's going to happen at the, neck, uh, at the uh, symposium of the Communist Party. Uh, my bet would be that she would have to uh, uh, share the power. So there will be, again, a collective leadership. But of course, I don't know. I'm not an expert here but running so huge economy so complex system just uh, with one person creates simply risk for the system of and course. i don't believe that the uh, communist party just for the sake of uh, improve the uh, resilience uh, of the system were would rather go for at least change of the prime minister and most probably changes in the uh, central committee of the communist party uh, but uh, basically behind my um, uh, my uh, statement here is also hope because uh, we don't need a contraction or a, a turbulence in the Chinese economy because it will create huge problems for the whole world. So I believe for the stability of China, it would be better if they could come back to the more collective way of uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. leadership. But from my personal very sh short uh, account at the dinner, the president office, I can tell you it's a super nice person, uh, super, super smart, uh, yeah. and uh, and so on. So uh, for sure, uh, uh, he's a great leader. Uh, and those who know me, I have never had appreciation for the communist system. But uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, there is a quite high degree of meritocracy, meritocracy uh, in the Communist Party as well. So it's not the Communist Party we can think from our Polish experience, okay. but it's a mixture of, um, uh, let's say, uh, 
taking the parallel to Germany, uh, there is an inverted comma Deutschland AG, so there's a kind of um, group of leaders, business leaders, politicians with very great influence on the German uh, politics. The same start to be, uh, same things uh, uh, can be okay. visible to less extent in Poland, but and in China you have a old style communist uh, rhetorics, but uh, beneath that you have uh, quite a deal of meritocracy. That would be my Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so coming. Let back. me, uh, Jelsi, if I may, I would like to, to add a few personal experiences uh, or views. First, our our main problem with China is not the politics that's a problem, but the main problem is the conflict between America and China. Will we uh, get between these millstones? Germany depends on China. Volkswagen is market leader in China. Uh, Mercedes BMW sell 40% of their cars in China. And um, on the, on the uh, mid-sized level companies, the companies Eden Champions, I have to do with politics play very little role. I, I deal with them with like with entrepreneurs from all other countries. What's behind going on behind the scenes, I, I, I don't see. And a word on the on the on the party people. I've uh, had many dinners where I was sitting on the side of the secretary of a, of, of a big city or a province, and these are smart people. Uh, one guy, I, I I asked him what did you study. He said I studied theology for ten years. Now he is the secretary of a party uh, of the party in a, in an eight million. Um, population city, uh, they, they are more like business people. Uh, again, I don't know, I don't see what's going on behind the scenes, but in my discussions with business people from China, it's like it's the same as my discussions with business people from Poland or from, from the United States. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Coming back to the hidden champion. Uh, champions, there is some confusion be and uh, reflected in the question that on one hand, when the companies uh, go abroad, the, 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 the classic uh, uh, advice, uh, management advice is to, uh, to, to gain visibility. On the other hand, the, 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 the definition of the hidden champion is that they, they are somehow hidden not known to the public. How do you see, Professor Zimon, this contradiction? It's actually not a contradiction. Uh, most of the products of the hidden champions you don't see. Probably nobody. Uh, Marek, did you know LSTM? I mean, the LSTM guys have to deal with Apple and Amazon and, and perhaps five others. And uh, you use theory of Apple but you are not interested what is behind this. And the same is true, I would say, for, for 70%, 70 something percent are in the B2B sector. So their customers know them. They have strong brands with their customers, but the general public does not know them. It has two disadvantages, potential disadvantage. One is the labor market, if you are unknown, it's uh, more difficult to track top talent. And if they go public, it's, of course, also not a, an advantage uh, if nobody knows them. So there are some business and, and they are becoming more open. But generally, the leaders are very focused. They don't appear much in the public. They don't give many speeches, etc. And I think that's another advantage. An interesting finding, by the way, by Jim Collins, a famous American management also, he found that companies are long-term more successful the less the leaders of the companies are known in the public. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. He, he distinguished between plow horses, horses who pull the plow and show horses who appear right. all the time in the public. Okay. I don't know how much time do we have, but still there... I am there flexible. Are... Yeah, okay. There are questions about the, the culture, the, the culture of the hidden champions. Uh, 
And uh, my, uh, I would like to rephrase th some questions related to that. Let's say in uh, uh, in Germany, you typically we refer to Mittelstand, yeah. That's, yeah. And to what extent the the the, the, the this culture can be linked to some kind of family business traditions, uh, or it, it you have to move, move out of it and move to the classic corporate structure to become successful globally. Yeah, that is one of the big challenges. Of course, uh, the, the roots are in family business structures. Um, about 70% are family-owned businesses, not necessarily run by managers from the family. We see an increasing share of non-family mm -hmm. managers. 10% are public, 10% are owned by private equity firms, and 10% are uh, parts of, of larger uh, groups or conglomerates. And the challenge which many of these entrepreneurs perceive and pay attention to is when they grow larger, can they keep this, this culture? And we have some, some very large companies who have been able to do that. The most famous example is Bosch. Bosch has 300,000 employees, but it's still the culture, uh, frugality, uh, modesty, humble. It's, it still has the culture of a, of, of, of a family-owned business, like a Mittelstands business. Okay. Uh, that's not true for other companies, but some have also, Wirt, Wirt has 79,000 people now, global leader in assembly product, and they still have this, the, the same culture they had uh, under, under the founder 20 years ago. But that's a very specific art to retain this family business type spirit in spite of increasing sense. And that's also a challenge for us. For instance, one element Next week, we have our so-called world meeting, this time in Madrid. We invite all 1,800 employees, even the secretaries, for a couple of days to this world meeting. And, and this is such an, it's very costly, but it's such a unique experience and a culture building mm -hmm. uh, foundation that I think it's worth the investment. Okay. The, the, the next question uh, uh, is related to innovation because you, your uh, advice in the more modern era is to hidden champions. Do not imitate, innovate. But on the other hand, the question was whether they, they, they should be also open to open innovation and referring to, for example, the, the, the strategic advice of Professor Odet Schenker, whether the hidden champions should opt for what he called innovation, parallelly innovate and innovate, buying uh, innovations from the market or getting innovations from the market. No, I mean, Every, 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 everything is true in a certain sense because it depends uh, very much on the specific situation. The extreme case is very high specialization. That they are so deep in, in their processes that they cannot buy anything from the outside. Another case is, say, a classical machinery company which goes into robotics automation needs a lot of IT. They have to become more open because they usually don't have the computer and IT and artificial intelligence things. That's a, a big challenge for them to, to open themselves to corporations. We see that in these business ecosystem. Uh, these systems were not typical for the history of hidden champions, but they are more and more uh, necessary now in order to integrate competences from different fields. And when it comes to acquisitions, some hidden champions have also grown uh, strongly through acquisitions. They usually do it along the value chain. So they, uh, they increase the vertical integration. The classical case is Kronis, the global leader for bottling systems. 
they started as a labeling machine company. So they put the labels on the on the bottles or the the cans, and today they have everything. So they they bought along the value chain, uh, did not invent everything themselves, and today they can uh, provide a whole factory to bottle Coca Cola or or whatever it is, mineral water, beer, etc. Okay. So coming probably to the uh, home base, uh, there was a question, uh, are there any hidden champions of a uh, Polish origin? Do we know them? Yes, uh, Marek, how many do we have? I don't have the number. Uh, there are a couple. And uh, I, I expect more in the uh, IT sector and i hope that they focus on on difficult it challenges rather of the b2b than the b2c type uh, marek what, so on, what on was my the list, last number you're having 50, uh, over 50 companies now uh yeah. I, I remember correctly 54 or 56 uh and uh, among the um participants of this meeting is a head of strategy for vigo uh, of vigo systems it's a listed company with us on the warsaw stock exchange and uh, in the uh, niche markets of uh, infrared uh, detectors, they are world market leader. For example, the Curiosity um, uh, Curiosity uh, robot on Mars was using actually daily detectors. So NASA is one of the clients. So it shows the the, uh, the level of uh, quality yeah. and sophistication. Usually when you have this most demanding clients, you are the world leader. I think you would agree. So you see, you are surrounded, Herman, by the, uh, even if you have a webinar in Poland, there are hidden champions uh, on your way. Um, there were also some hidden champions from the original list uh, back from 2002, which bankrupted. <laughs> it happens. Not many of them, but I think four. And what is astonishing, uh, Herman uh, mentioned Booksy. Uh, it's not a typical hidden champion as it's a service company and uh, it's very B2C <laughs> or B2B2C <laughs> company. Uh, and it's really expanding, um, uh, wonderful, but it's moved to the, to the US. Um, and this also happens to other uh, uh, IT uh, companies uh, that they are um, moving to the US. And that's, that's a huge challenge for Europe that we invest uh, a lot in form of private, but also public money uh, in startups, but uh, two thirds of them move them to the US. Um, and also there are uh, some hidden champions, or not, not really hidden champions, but there uh, there is very nice uh, um, collection of Poles who were successful in building up uh, global companies. Uh, one of the most uh, recent example is Wish, Wish.com, and one of the two, the two founders, I mean, they're all US Americans, but uh, one was born in China and one was born in Poland and was educated in Poland. So you see that uh, that this uh, that this issue of talent retention or uh, and in the next phase talent acquisition is the key challenge so we have a great pool of talents but uh, we uh, relative to our talents we should have had uh, more uh, hidden champions down in Poland here but somehow it's uh, it was for whole Polish history that uh, it was a bumpy road so people were moving out of poland some moving back some and there is a list of uh, very successful entrepreneurs from 19th century or beginning of 20th centuries who for example could have been uh, hidden champions today or uh, even owners so shareholders so their families could be owners or shareholders of large conglomerates but for example the uh, soviet uh, revolution um, dissolved these dreams uh, and i can also name a uh, few a uh, few uh, cases here. So uh, uh, bottom line is that there are 50 plus uh, known to us hidden champions, but of course there are uh, many others uh, which are very, very hidden and one day we're going to discover them, Herman. Okay. Yeah, see some numbers may be interesting in this context. Altogether, I have detected, I found about 3,600 hidden champions in the world. Germany has the largest number with 1,500. Maybe I have a better coverage there. Uh, US is number two, Japan number three. In China, we have now a little over 100. And, and that also relates uh, to some extent to the history of Poland. 
Um, many of the German hidden champions are more than 100 years old. They were founded before the First World War. And of course, it takes decades to build a global leadership position. That does not happen within 10 or 20 years. You need two, three generations. Look simply at the global network of, of uh, Kertscher. They started 1970, and that's 50 years ago. Now they have 120. Uh, but you cannot do that in 10 or 20 years. OK. Uh, but probably the last question, the, you mentioned that you need time and, of course, and the ambitious to grow. But then uh, kind of support of government uh, in your book, uh, you mentioned uh, some projects, uh, or gov pro support programs in various countries, ideas. Uh, could you indicate which of these programs uh, uh, directions could be effective? And uh, um, yeah, you, you could advise uh, uh, yeah. as, as kind of promotion of these hidden champions in the country. In, in my service, I also addressed uh, this issue, the role of the government, and overall, the government uh, did not play an important role for the development of the hidden champions, especially not with regard to globalization. But there are some very important contributions, and the most important contribution of the government is the vocational training system in Germany. Uh, where you have the vocational schools run by the government, which the apprentices visit for two days per week and for three days they work in a company. So this could use in modern talk, it's a public-private partnership. This is the most important part. Another important part is inheritance tax or absence of inheritance tax. In, in Germany, if you continue operations of your company, you don't have to pay inheritance tax. In countries with high inheritance tax, like in France, a Mittelstand does not develop because every uh, generation the company will be financially weakened because it has to pay these huge inheritance taxes. So these are just two not so yeah. evident uh, contributions of the government to the development of, of uh, the Mittelstand. Okay, thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, this was a fascinating uh, topic and probably we could discuss it uh, for hours, uh, which is made that this a suggestion that maybe we can come back to this issue uh, in some, some time. At this stage, I, I, can, uh, I can thank all the participants in my role and turn to the organizers of, of this webinar. Uh, professor, professor and doctor, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, it was, um, I've never uh, dreamed uh, of, uh, I, I never would have dreamed of having so many wonderful people uh, in uh, one webinar. Uh, it was really great pleasure. Uh, great uh, lessons for uh, every participants on the other side. So, I hope we will meet again. Uh, Herman, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Jerzy, thank you for being a great moderator. Marek, thank you that uh, you uh, find uh, a little gap between being uh, uh, in Devil, Davos and uh, Warsaw. It was uh, really pleasure to have you uh, here in We Innovators Club. I would like to ask uh, Paweł, uh, Paweł, say us uh, who will be the next our uh, guest uh, next month. And have a great uh, evening. Mm, and I hope we will meet in a, a market with uh, in in a different uh, hidden channels. Thank you. Yes, yes. So we invite you in almost a month on June twenty nine. Yes, um, we we met uh, with um, uh, Joseph Eschbacher, general director of European Space Agency. So uh, we uh, have a very cosmic meeting with us.
Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed meeting you at least virtually, and I hope to be able to come uh, to meet you personally in, in the near future. Thank you. We very hope much. so. Good Always like that. Uh, uh, Herman, uh, so, sorry, yeah. sorry for films. I don't know why uh, StreamYard didn't work. Uh, but uh, I paste all YouTube films uh, to our guests. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.